If you look around you, you will notice that we are surrounded by embedded systems. Coffee machines, smart kitchen appliances, drones, and so on. All of these devices rely on a small computer, and most of them run the same operating system, which is Linux. When this board receives power, it instantly begins the Linux boot process. This process is a chain of steps that brings the hardware to life and eventually hands control over to the user. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the main stages of that process. And to make everything concrete, I'll use the BeagleBone Black as an example, because it's one of the most popular boards for learning with embedded Linux. When we say that the board is booted, we mean that the user finally has control over the device. In practice, this happens once the root file system has been mounted. At that point, you can browse files and directories, access configuration, and interact with the hardware. The ports, the sensors, and even the display. Everything becomes available. It's the moment where the device stops just starting up and actually becomes usable. So you can even run a video on the display panel, for instance. From here on, the operating system is fully alive. All of this is ultimately managed by the Linux kernel. So, the bootloader's main role is simply to load the kernel and start it. From that point on, the kernel takes control. It initializes the hardware, mounts the root file system, and launches the very first user space process, whether that's in it or system D. This is what brings the system to a fully usable state, where applications can start and the user can interact with the device. But for a time being, let's cover an overview of the booting process. The very first piece of software that runs is the boot ROM. It's stored directly inside the SOC and it executes immediately when power is applied. Its job is extremely limited. It sets up just enough of the hardware to continue the boot process, and then it passes control to the first stage bootloader. The first stage bootloader's job is to initialize the hardware properly, especially the external RAM so that the next stage can run in a fully functional environment. And just like the previous stage, once it has completed its work, it passes control to the second stage bootloader, which will continue the boot process. At this stage, the second stage bootloader initializes a broader set of peripherals and prepares everything the kernel will need. It loads the kernel image, the device tree, and sets the boot arguments. And once all of that is ready, it passes control to the Linux kernel. When we describe the boot process, we often say that each stage passes control to the next one, and that wording is intentional. A bootloader doesn't call the next stage the way a function would call another function. If it did, it would eventually return back to the previous stage, but that never happens during boot. Each stage loads the next one into memory, gives it control, and then effectively ceases to exist until the next reset. So, you can think of the boot process like a rocket launch, where each stage helps push the system higher until Linux finally takes over. At the very bottom, we have the boot ROM, the code burned directly into the chip. It provides the initial push by powering up the SOC and loading the very first bootloader. Above it sits MLO, the first stage bootloader, which is around 150 kilobytes. And at the top of the stack, we have U-Boot, the second stage bootloader, which is around 500 kilobytes. This is the component that loads the Linux kernel, the device tree, and prepares everything needed for the kernel to start. Together, these stages form a chain that progressively brings the system to life until Linux finally launches, just like the upper stage of a rocket. To summarize, the objective is to load and run the kernel. This job is done by the second stage bootloader, U-boot in our example. So at this point, you might be wondering, why can't the system jump directly from the boot ROM to U-boot, which will load the kernel afterward, right? So what is the purpose of the first stage bootloader? To understand why we need multiple boot stages, we first need to look at the hardware, specifically the SOC, the system on chip. The SOC is essentially the brain of the entire board. Inside this single package, we have the CPU core, caches, internal RAM, ROM, and a whole collection of hardware blocks. The display engine, the memory interface, the serial peripherals, and much more. But what's important here is that the SOC only contains a very small amount of internal RAM, just enough for the earliest boot code. 
and that internal RAM is extremely expensive in Silicon area. That's why it's kept minimal. And remember, we said that U-Boot is around 500 kilobytes. This limitation is one of the key reasons we can't load a large bootloader like U-Boot directly from the ROM. The hardware simply doesn't have enough internal memory available at power on, so we need to load it somewhere else. And this brings us to the next important point, the external RAM you see here, the modern, the DDR, which is not part of the SOC. It's a separate component on the board, and U-Boot will be loaded into this memory. So the natural question is, if the boot ROM can find U-Boot on the storage device, why not simply load U-Boot directly into the external RAM and run it? The short answer is, it can't. And the reason is simple. The SOC has no knowledge of how the external hardware is configured. Here's the core of the problem. Imagine we have three boards with the same SOC, but have a completely different type of external RAM. One board might use DDR2 from Transcend, another might use DDR3 from the same vendor, and a third one might use DDR3 from Kingston with completely different timing parameters. And the boot ROM has no way of knowing which RAM chip is connected, what its speed is, or what configuration it requires. Because of that, the ROM bootloader simply cannot initialize external RAM. That's why a small intermediary bootloader like MLO is required. It contains the board-specific RAM initialization code that the boot ROM code cannot provide. So to summarize, let's explore the process from the ground up. First, all the software components must be stored in a persistent storage device, an SD card in our example. The boot ROM is the first piece of software that runs. It loads the MLO into the internal RAM of the SOC. Once the MLO has initialized the external RAM, it loads U-Boot into it. Then U-Boot loads the kernel and the device tree into the external RAM. Finally, the kernel mounts the root file system. I used an SD card in this example, but in reality, you could use other types of storage as well. When the boot ROM starts, it needs to find the first stage bootloader, the MLO file. To do that, it follows a predefined boot priority list. Depending on the configuration of the SOC and the state of the boot pins, it will search for the MLO in several possible sources. It tries each device in order, and as soon as it finds a valid MLO image, it loads it into the internal RAM and executes it. This is the very first step in bringing the system to life. As I said earlier, exact boot priority doesn't come from nowhere. It's determined by the boot pins on the AM335X, small configuration pins that the boot ROM reads at power on. Depending on the value of these pins, the SOC selects a different boot order. For example, with this combination of pins, the boot ROM will first check the EMMC, then the SD card, then UART, and finally USB 0. If you change the boot pin values, the priority list also changes. Here, with a different pin configuration, the boot ROM tries the devices in a different order. This mechanism allows the hardware to decide where the system should boot from. In short, the Linux boot process is a sequence of stages, each created to work around real hardware limits. The boot ROM gives the system its first push, the first stage bootloader brings up the external RAM, and the second stage bootloader loads the kernel and device tree. The kernel then initializes the hardware and mounts the root file system. Each stage hands control to the next, forming a reliable chain from raw silicon to a running Linux system.